We're going to be talking about Ron DeSantis, the uh, latest sort of sweetheart of the Republican Party. A lot of people see him as like the alternative to Trump and uh, whether there's going to be a civil war between the two of them is left to be seen. Uh, we're going to be talking about him, trying to understand who is this this governor of Florida, the good, the bad, what does he represent, what does he stand for? And uh, I am here with, well, first we got a guy who's, well, he's looking tough. He's got uh, some kind of uh, facial hair and a beanie. I would not mess with this guy. It's Mark Pellegrino. What's up, man? Not much. And we've got a guy who, you know, he often says right before we go live, I, you know, I don't I don't know that much about this. I don't have that much prepared. You're going to have to do most of the heavy lifting. So I thought today, let's let this guy sit in silence. No, not let him speak not let him show us any clips of nothing. He, let's give him an easy day, easy day off. He can just sit in silence. It's Nico Sotiracopoulos. Never. So, so that our audience doesn't have to, I watched uh, the Santi talk in the national and the National Conservatives Conference. Now, our topic today is what is his ideology? It's difficult to spot a politician's ideology because usually they speak in these uh, highlight uh, small clips that they just want to make headlines. So when a politician speaks for one hour in a conference, which has a very specific ideological orientation, then that's a good place to start to see what this guy is up about. So what I've done is I've collected some highlights and we're going to discuss them. So he begins by stating some of his uh, principles. And his principles are, he says, I stand for common sense, core American principles, I fight the elites, and I have a backbone. Now, if we take them one by one, these principles say absolutely nothing about who you are. So common sense. I don't know a single person who hasn't got common sense. Every Democrat is going to say they want common sense gun reform. Uh, everyone thinks they have common sense. He says he stands for core American principles. But as he says in the next sentence, these principles can be applied to the current time. So don't be too strict with these principles. Again, he doesn't tell us which are these core American principles. Then he's telling us that he's fighting the elites. I would say so do communists. And also, he says that he has a backbone. So has, I don't know, Mike Tyson, every professional fighter. So someone having a backbone doesn't tell me anything. I guess he means a moral backbone. But as we will see, if a moral backbone means having a strong principles, this is not something which uh, characterizes the Sandys. And we will see why. So he starts by throwing banalities and throwing generality. So we already know that this guy's probably, we're not going to get much from him. Now you could say, look, a politician has to say these things. But remember, this is an ideological conference. This is a conference called National NATCON, the NATCON, the National Conservative Conference. So you expect to listen to some ideas rather than, than these platitudes that, uh, that, make, uh, that make no sense. Shall I go on? Yes. I mean, hey. I mean, there's look, there's we'll never uh, not get to everything or we will never get to all the stuff we could say. But just like he says, he's for common sense, you know, and like the uh, the leftists, uh, social justice, whatever uh, the various factions of the uh, of the the left, they say, oh, it's about experience. And, you know, you got to get the, the black person's experience and the lesbians experience. And and like they're always there's always like a, a, a hint of truth in what all of these people are saying. Yes, common sense. Yes, experience is kind of what it all boils down to. Without experience, we'd have nothing to philosophize with. So it's like they're all they're all they're all kind of uh, packaging something true, something good with a bunch of other stuff. And this is why philosophy is so important in order to, uh, you know, separate the good from the bad and offer the, the truth. So there's that. So then he talks about the scientific and technological elite. And he said that most people remember that Eisenhower warned us about the, industri the military industrial complex, but there is other danger, which is the scientific technological elite. So he's throwing red meat here to the culture warriors by throwing them big pharma, scientific, and big tech technological elite. And here's something interesting where he says, he says, these groups have their own interests that need to be, quote, harmonized by a good statesman. So a good statesman is a harmonizer. 
So this is how DeSantis views his role. Not someone who will guarantee to you that you will have your freedoms, but someone who will harmonize interests. And this harmonization is also central to the vision of national conservatives. National conservatives tell us that freedom leads to conflict. Freedom leads to you having your interest pits against my interest. Therefore, what we need to do is harmonize. We need to find some balance, a bit of your freedom and a bit of my freedom. And this is something with which DeSantis agrees. Now, this is not a good defense of freedom. Actually, this is a horrible defense of freedom. It tells you that there is a contradiction of interest between people who don't intervene in each other's individual rights. So do we have any anything anything here? Well, I think I think he would have been he's he's proper to point out that these technological and scientific elites are in fact elitists. But what makes them what makes them elite, and I'm talking about in the sense that he means it, is the fact that they are intertwined with government. And to the extent that they're doing the government's will and pitching projects for the sake of expanding the state, it's 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 within his purview to stop that for sure, to separate the two. We 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 think that economics and politics should be separate. So should science. So should technology. They should all be separate from the government. And that's the way you you keep these people elitists in their field because they're good. And they're an aristocracy of achievement. That's great, but you don't inter intermingle them with government. Right. And yeah, Raga, go on. As as usual, the, uh, he's taking a an actual problem, which is you know like that science and government are in bed together, or that there is some sort of elitist class. But uh, he's 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 turning uh, the sort of conspiracy, the so the alleged conspiracy, into sort of the motivating factor of all of it. Like uh, the reason we have you know a, a a widespread belief in let's say global warming or climate change and and the widespread belief that the government needs to basically nationalize everything to deal with this problem it was motivated by like um scientists and government wanting to trick us all whereas i think um i think sort of uh reframing how we think of these things philosophically is sort of the the way out of this and 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 the way to identify how we got to this state uh, you know like alex epstein is doing that and i saw him on uh i didn't watch it yet but i saw that he was on jordan peterson yeah channel and peterson named he like named the video something like you know the green the like the climate hoax not hoax but like the uh, even work dystopia just some i think no i think he called it the cr the climate con Con, right? Like we were conned. Like it's one big, um, like orchestrated thing. But I, I, like, I think that type of um thinking makes people paranoid and incoherent. That the fact is, it, it like we, I think we got to this state sort of because of faulty thinking and a faulty view, including a faulty view of the role of government, but definitely a a faulty view of the relationship between man and his and the planet, and uh, various other faults in, in intellectually. And that's how we got here. So. Uh, so like someone like Peterson is like mud muddying the water by uh, by using that type of language. And it, it sounds like uh, DeSantis is doing the same thing with some of this language about elites. So that's, that's I'm glad to I... see, though, that this discussion that you said between Peterson and Alex Epstein has already 300, 500 views, sorry, 300, 500,000 views in uh, in six days. So when DeSantis starts really going in a very problematic, for lack of a better word, way, is when he talks about his record when it comes to the pandemic. Now, you'd expect that this was his strong point. So if there was one state that I would want to live during the pandemic, it would be Florida. So he was the best governor or one of the best governors when it comes to not, uh, uh, not doing some of the authoritarian things that other states did. But he also did something which is actually authoritarian. And this is that he said that the rules regarding masks and vaccine mandates, particular vaccine mandates, the rules that says that there should be no mandates also apply to private companies. And he gave a justification for it, which is very, very noteworthy. So can the producer please play the clip, which is some seconds, when he explains before you play the context is he explains why his the ban on vaccine mandates applies also to private companies. Let's listen to it. I don't hear it. I don't hear it either. 
Okay, let's let's move on, and then when our producer is uh, ready to play it with sound, we will play it with sound. Oh, I think let's he's ready. maybe to do it. What's wrong with that? Well, I'll tell you what okay, wrong, good. what's wrong with that. Rewind so that we see has a right from to the participate beginning. In and there were some conservatives that said, yeah, well, government shouldn't do vaccine passport, but if a private business wants to do it, what's wrong with that? Well, I'll tell you what wrong, what's wrong with that is an individual has a right to participate in society. And we're not just going to sit idly by if you're trying to circumscribe people's freedoms. And that's true if it's government. It's also true if it's big business. Mm. So this is... What he's actually saying is that an individual has rights and these rights cannot be circumscribed, whether you're government or whether you're a big business. Notice that it says big business, but this also applies to small business. What this means is that your property rights go out of the window. This means that your property rights come into conflict with the supposed right of an individual to enter any cafe they want. This is the rationale and the justification that has been used by every leftist, authoritarian, or wannabe central planner, or nanny statist for things like the smoking ban. They say, oh, but I have a right to a smoke-free uh, environment. Therefore, uh, please impose uh, something on this uh, restaurant. Or I have a right to X and someone has to provide it to me. Therefore, impose this to this private business. So this is actually a mockery of rights. This is a mockery of an individual being free. What about the freedom of the business to do as they wish in their premises? What if the business says, I don't want anyone in my premises, passports or not, they have the right to do so. Or they might say, I only want people who are blonde with one eye. They have the right to do so. The Sandis doesn't understand this, which is why this, and this shows that the Sandis doesn't, under, doesn't understand freedom and he's actually a threat to freedom. Yeah. yeah. So, Go ahead. I mean, yeah, if anybody, this is a perfect example. If anybody thinks there's a difference between the left and the right, establishment left and right, this is a perfect example of how not different they are, how similar they are. Um, when red meat for both Republicans and Democrats are the enemy of big business, you know, being the enemy of the big business, standing up against uh, big business. You know that you've you've reached a time in history where it's time to take a third alternative because the two that are out there are really a uh, difference only in in uh, in name only, not not in kind. Yeah, and a lot of big businesses probably wouldn't even <laughs> mind just doing what the governor tells them to do in Florida, but small businesses like you know coffee shops pipe shops, you know, uh, hippy dippy type stores where the owner is left leaning, they're generally probably more likely to want, ma you know, vaccines or masks in their store, and they may not make that requirement of their customers. And in some cases, it could be for their own health that they want masks, let's say, in their store. And they, you know, in Florida, it sounds like they were not able to make that decision. So um, he can use the word big. He could put, throw the word big in front of anything. And it it's like a it's like a blank check for him to uh, violate the principles of capitalism, to violate people's property rights. Just put the word big next to anything. Big tech, big business, big pharma, everything. Put big right. and you can violate the rights. Go ahead. Yeah, you're the little guy versus the big guy. You're the you're the uh, uh, David versus Goliath. And you, you have automatic moral primacy. Um yeah, there you go. These, these guys aren't any different from the left. And they see themselves as anti-establishment. They see themselves as like the uh, rebellious, you know, uh, uh, disruptive populists. I mean, they are populists. They are all of those things. But they, you know, they're 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 basically fighting the establishment, the elite, the lizard people. They're fighting them by expanding the, the scope of government and further intertwining business, especially big business with government yeah, in a way know, that'll be very hard to untangle. Yeah. And when you're an anti-mask mandator, you're still a mandator. So he can't be against mandates. He can't Ooh, say boom. Sort He's also mandate. opposed to actual mandates. It sounds like because he had the opposite view of the gay wedding controversy, according to um, uh, Nicholas in the chat room. So back then, when the gay wedding cake was a controversial topic, uh, DeSantis, according to Mr. Nicholas, he, he respected the right of a baker to pick and choose which customers to serve, including to reject the 
uh, patronage of a of two two men getting married or two women marrying one another. So, uh, but I guess that's shameless. Yeah. shameless. It's so right. shameless. Well, they they they. This is what happens when everybody's rejecting principles on principle. They're just like, oh, we're not ideologues. We're not, you know, we're we, we just we're just we just care about what works, quote unquote, and we just want to smash the. Uh, the the establishment. I mean, they they are really like film negatives of the left, right? The leftists want to smash the patriarchy. They want to smash what they consider the white supremacist uh, system. And uh, these guys, everything they don't like, they just call establishment or big, and they can smash it all they want. This time with the help of government. Whereas at least a lot of the leftists, they're they're screaming they're screaming in all of our ears. But uh, I haven't seen the the leftists in recent years rushing to use the the force of government on the level that the populist right has been doing. Although I'm sure they'll be catching up before I know it. So, I disagree you know, with you. I disagree. With you, you disagree. Okay. Another conversation. I mean, what's okay. The, what's the green new deal anyway? We'll go on. We'll, we'll, we'll go on with that. Let's go on because I right. have to leave in 12 minutes and right. I still have half a page, but this is a, this is a one hour talk where 90% of the talk is during my time, I passed a law to, achieve this political initiative and most of these laws are laws that here's another example of a law so he passed a law according to which employees of a private business i repeat of a private business have a right to opt out of crt workshops of uh, of their employers so the point is an employee has a right to go to work and not be brainwashed by their employer an employee has a right to change job if they don't like it. Right. An employee has a right to tell to his employer, hey, uh, I don't want to go. And the employer has the right to tell him, okay, then we part ways. Yeah, except you... oh, yes, except no, gonna... if okay. you have this central planner mentality, which is the socialist mentality that says that, oh, the worker has a right mm -hmm. to that particular job. Yeah, and what gives them the right is the power differential between the two, between the employer, the person with the resources, and the fact that they don't have them. So it's the need, it's the position of being less than on the hierarchy that gives that person the right to to uh, to dominate the other. So it's a completely leftist point of view, and it's it's so hysterical that nobody in the audience seems to understand that the two the two camps have merged; they're one. Right. They have. Um, by the, should we read a couple super chats and then continue or? A couple. Yeah, a couple. Okay. Marilyn, thank you for the $10. Marilyn with $2 says, so businesses don't have rights? Um, <laughs> not if they're big. Not if they're big, or, but really uh, these policies uh, affect all, all size businesses. Um, Marilyn with $5 says, are there any decent Republican candidates on the horizon? If it's Biden and DeSantis, I'm not voting. Uh, I don't know of any. But I will say this on an optimistic note. Has anyone paid attention to the governor of Colorado? This guy, you would think you're living in another dimension. This guy is so reasonable and good on the issues in today's context. Uh, he was on Bill Maher of, uh, a month, uh, like shortly before the season ended. The, the governor of Colorado currently, look this guy up. He's a Democrat who says the way to deal with inflation is to deregulate and let in the immigrants. He, you know, legalized drugs, of course, let, let, you know, I think he himself is a gay man, you know, God bless him. We're staying out of his bedroom. He's staying out of everyone's boardroom. He's this guy. Is, I, I don't think he's running for president, but uh, if there's any light at the end of the tunnel and, and uh, Richard with five dollars says national conservatism equals national socialism. It is well, uh, not literally in the way that we're going to no. have pogroms and stuff. But uh, if you want to hear more about national conservatism, I did a whole uh, episode with, I think it was either Ben or Elan from the Anran Institute. Go to New Idea Live. We have a whole one hour where we discuss the manifesto of national conservatives. Uh, I've read the book by Yoram Hazoni. And uh, actually, it's worse than you than you'd think. Philosophically, there's not much daylight between the Nazis and a lot of a lot of thinkers. I mean, that's that's kind of part of the problem that that the world didn't really learn the lessons of World War Two because they they understand that like totalitarianism is undesirable, but the f philosophies that impacted Germany and Russia, et cetera, uh, remained, I think, a largely prevalent and and emboldened in houses of learning. 
I think there is a big difference, but uh, okay. that's not of, that's not for for today. You mentioned immigration. Let's see what is his take on immigration. So many apologists of the conservatives would say, "Oh, we're only against illegal immigrations, and we do- just don't want uh, criminals and gang members." The Sandis though says that there might also be problems with legal immigration. Why? Because often it go- it does not promote the national interest. So this is the yardstick for national conservatives. The yardstick is national interest. It's not your rights. It's what is the national interest. Who is to decide the national interest? A central planner or a philosopher king like DeSantis. So whether you want to hire a brilliant mind from India, from Greece, from China, or from wherever, you will have to take the permission of the great philosopher king who will tell you whether you pro you taking this programmer is in accordance with the national interest. So again, in one more area where the sun is wouldn't know freedom if it hit him on the head. Yeah, I mean, national interest, common good. I mean, this this is just different ways of describing the same thing from the right and the left. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, why- there- go on, Raga. There was a time when Republicans would have been embarrassed to speak this way. And of course, they were far from perfect. They were they had a lot of problems. They were definitely always too religious in recent in recent times. But uh, there was a time when like Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and maybe even DeSantis, if he was in politics uh, before the Trump era, they would they would not be speaking in these. At least they wouldn't be speaking in these terms. They were anti protectionist in at least their rhetoric. And then there was a there was a moment I recall where Marco Rubio kind of delivered a speech. This was like two or three years into Trump's presidency, where it was like the moment when kind of people realized, OK, this is the way of the Republicans now. Uh, when Marco Rubio, the Tea Party candidate, is talking about putting the uh, com- uh, economic interests of the nation above the individual's selfish desires. That's when, you know, times are a changing. <laughs> And why is his uh, take on rights so bad? Because the way he understands rights is that rights come from God. So who is to, who is again to explain to us how exactly God wants us to have rights? The philosopher king, the central planner, the great, uh, the great statesman, the big, the great uh, leader. Then he is boasting about how he punished Disney for having a partisan opinion. And actually, hidden in in that part, there's a good moment there where he says, well, of course they have their First Amendment rights if they want to be partisans. But he says, this means that we will stop subsidizing them. So he claims that Disney has been, quote, subsidized. This basically means probably they had tax uh, exceptions or tax uh, beneficial tax scheme in Florida. And he says, because Disney is fighting for uh, the woke agenda and he he's using the i think the example of something with with uh, gender and tra- transgender and something like that i don't remember exactly uh, he says that now they will have to pay their fair share of taxes and these are his words so this is chronism this is saying i'm gonna do you a favor but since you are of different politics than the politics i like now I'm going to punish you, and now you'll have to pay your, quote, fair share. So he's proudly announcing from uh, from uh, from the states that, well, if your politics are okay, you might get tax exemptions. If not, uh, you're not going to get uh, tax exemptions. Why? Because I can, is, is, the, mm-hmm. is the line. So someone might ask, what is then his take on capitalism, on the free enterprise system? And he says, we are in favor of free enterprise, but we are against, quote, corporatism. What is a corporatism? What is corporatism? He doesn't tell us. (laughs) And he says, the free enterprise is a means to an end. As he says, we have an economy because we want to have a country, not not the other way around. So again, we see the rallying cry of national conservatism, the standard the yardstick, the criterion is whether something is in accordance to the national interest. Free enterprise, whatever this means, in accordance 
corporatism, whatever that means, is not in accordance to the national interest. Therefore, it's okay to regulate. It's okay to intervene in the economic life on the country. And then he enters to the point of, sorry, and then he inserts the issue of big tech. And what he's telling us is that there is no free speech for big tech for two reasons. He says, first, because they collude with the government. Now, this is very muddy what this means. But he says, even if they did not collude with the government, there's still some uh, ground to regulate them. Why? Because they are trying to impose an orthodoxy. What does that mean? What does this mean they're trying to impose an orthodoxy? He doesn't explain. He says that this is a government agenda that, uh, of that orthodoxy. Therefore, even if it's not an official, uh, an official cooperation, we still have ground to regulate big tech. And he says that the role of the government is to create a space, to give a space to the individuals to be free. Notice, not to protect their individual rights, but to create a space where the individuals can be free, which means to centrally plan what is the proper amount of uh, competition? So this is the Santis. During his talk, he throws all the red meat that he that he has to. He talks about Soros. He talks about Fauci. He talks about globalism, the World Economic Forum, mRNA vaccines. Uh, recently, we uh, I heard that uh, in the news that uh, he's uh, instituting a judiciary commission or something uh, to do some research on the mRNA vaccines. He also talked about, say, this stuff happening in elections. So he winks also maybe to, to the Trump supporters there. So my last words before I, because I'll have to leave and then you two will continue. So this was his whole speech. So I'm not even convinced that he's a better choice than what uh, Trump was. And here's here's why. This guy's consciously, consciously anti-freedom. This guy's ideologically against freedom. Trump has no ideology. Trump doesn't know what he's talking about. This guy has taken a conscious decision that I'm a central planner, although in his speech he says, of course I'm not a central planner, but this guy has decided he's a central planner and he has decided that national interest goes above your individual rights. Therefore, I see him as quite an important threat to freedom. Is he a bigger freedom? Is he a bigger threat to freedom than the left? That remains to be seen. But having watched this talk, he's way worse than I thought. And I encourage people to go and find that talk. It's from three months ago. Go uh, put on YouTube Nation, uh, NatCon, National Conservative Conference. The Sundance, it's there. It's one hour. And one last thing. The biggest applause he's, get, he's getting from the audience is when he's telling how he regulated uh, big tech or he regulated businesses again the, against the vaccine mandates or when he uh, when, when he talks about his central planning achievements so this is the hope the great hope for freedom for 2024 if this is the case we are really really in trouble Anyway, gentlemen, sorry, I'll have to leave. Hold on, you, you, you said you said thirty-five after. It's only thirty after, don't you have? No, thirty-five minute? after. I need to be outside of the door. <laughs> okay, well, let me ask you one question, if you yes. have a second. Who is yeah. the worst leader of the Roman Empire, or of ancient Rome? It's very difficult to decide because it wasn't only one. Okay, well, I will offer it was Caligula because he was insane. So he wasn't just power lusting, but he was the guy who appointed his horse as le as some as some position. <laughs> And for that reason, Trump is worse than any worse than Josh Hawley, worse than all these dis, despicable uh, populist authoritarians. To me, a guy who is beholden to know nothing in reality and who people go with, to me, that's the scariest thing because we are putting reason to flight when that guy is in power. Well, let so, me tell you this. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day who is worse. What matters is that we have made the case that they're really, 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 really bad. When I said he's worse, here's what I mean. I don't think it's worth for people to say, okay, now I'll return to the Republican Party because at least here, here is a guy who is more serious than Trump. The guy is more serious than Trump, but the bar is very, very low. But mm. at the same time, he's ideologically dangerous consciously ideologically dangerous he's consciously anti 
liberal, liberal with the proper sense of the word. I need to tell Gentlemen. you something before you leave. Yes. The, the governor of Colorado is named Jared Polis, P-O-L-I-S. What does that mean in Greece? City state or something? <laughs> right? <laughs> polis is, is a city, indeed. Yeah, it's a city state where like ancient Athens, well, they had polices, <laughs> they had different districts. Isn't that amazing? You say, you say, okay, you say, okay, I'm late. Bye. All right, bye, Nikos. What's that? You say poli if they're um, plural? Poli. I suppose you would, yeah. Poli, oh. poli, yeah. You know what I got out of this little uh, little talk about DeSantis is if you don't know that we're all fascists now, you're not living on this planet. We're basically all fascists now. Yeah. And something I learned from liberal fascism, the book by Go uh, Jonah Goldberg uh, way back when um, he talked about corporatism. So that's where I learned that word. Corporatism is a, an advent of the progressives. And DeSantis says he's opposed to corporatism, like he's opposed to business and government colluding. But what's he doing? He's going to engineer the economy. What does that actually look like in practice? Literally picking which business it's going to be a big business picking, you know, that Coca-Cola is best suited to provide us with our with our drinks and at the at the expense of Pepsi. I mean, it's absolute corporatism that he's proposing uh, in the super chat. Kirk says two dollars for two dollars. Criticizing DeSantis, what are you on the left? <laughs> um, I mean, there are people who accuse me and maybe you sometimes of being on the left for like, I don't know, being pro capitalism vis a vis yeah. uh, Trump. Uh, Jonathan Honig with 499 sends a sticker that we're at a hippopotamus is saying hype. Yep, it is pretty hype when it, we're not severely depressed by the happenings. Um, yeah. So uh, anything else about DeSantis's uh, speech? I mean, there's just so much there, but like generally he takes an actual problem and marries it to a horrible solution, which is the opposite of what, usually of what he should do. Which is which is, uh, you know, par for the course for the left, too. They take an actual problem, marry it to a horrible solution. And 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 just like him, use hyperbole to try to scare people into into believing what he believes or purports to believe. Look, man, 2024 is going to be a scary time. I'm not looking forward to it. I hope the two years or the, or the next year or so goes by really, really slowly, because I think we're in for some uh 1968 type of civil unrest and some some very very scary times we've got two heartless demagogues on the right who don't really care about quote unquote national national interests they care about their own political prerogatives and they're going to do i trump definitely will do anything he can to win which is frightening because that literally means anything and DeSantis is a is a subtler beast who, who should be you should be scared of as well so um, and then what do we have on the other side? Uh, senility and basically someone who's a puppet for the corporatist leftism. So, you know, we're uh, we're screwed. We're between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, but also um, I think the worst is behind us for this era. I think the 2020 rioting and the unrest and the uh, January 6th stuff and all of that, I, I think is as bad as this cycle is going to get. I, I may be okay. alone in thinking this. I really think the the Republicans that they lost in 2022 recently so badly that like it, it indicates to me that like people are moving to the center and they're voting. And the more elections reflect that, the more the more uh, these populists are going to realize they're on the losing side. Well, I, and, I agree with you, but when it's not it's not about winning or losing elections for a cat like Trump, it's about just winning or losing. It's his 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 narcissism is so embedded in that concept. He won't let it go. So you're right. The establishment Republicans are trying to shift a little more to the center. And I think DeSantis represents that in a way for in their minds. They, they see that he's a losing proposition. And even conservative papers like the New York Post are starting to vehemently stand up against Trump. But he's he's announced his candidacy. So he's immune to this fact. And he, he's announced his candidacy. So he's his candidacy. So he's immune to whether or not it's going to cause great turmoil in the country. And so I suspect he's going to go third party. And, and I think as a third party candidate with, with less sanity than uh, Teddy Roosevelt and more, not, not more narcissism, but certainly more, you know, directed narcissism than, uh, than Roosevelt, he'll, he'll, he'll make the most out of that. Whatever that means, I think we're in for something unless they, Unless Congress is able to shackle him and indict him with something and put him in jail, then he'll he'll run from jail probably. 
there's a good chance he's he'll either go to jail or flee the country. And Michael Sanders saying he's unable to send a super chat. Just ask the question in the regular chat, Michael. We'll we'll answer it or we'll address it. Um, the um, I I agree Trump isn't going anywhere, but I I don't like I. I sort of think like Republicans in general have the ghost of Trump to contend with. Even if Trump were to drop dead today, they would still I mean, it would give the Republicans life on Twitter for for 24 hours because they would get to announce, ha ha, Trump was vaccinated and he died. Yes, it's proof we were right all along. But beyond that, the Republicans, they've got a lot of baggage at this point. So I'm not I'm hardly excited to say Democrats are going to be winning but I am happy to say it does seem like Democrats are playing it safe lately and moving to the center. Biden was that he was not the squad. He was not Bernie Sanders. He is, you know, the most uh, like mainstream and like uh, familiar type of Democrat. Not, not from the second he came into office, though. He, came, he, 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 he stamped his foot down and drew a line in the sand by immediately uh, undoing all the executive orders, some of which were very good, you know, that some of which should have remained. But in the interest of being anti-Trump, he fell right into the camp of the activist left eco state statists who are, are advancing an agenda that he's a party. To, he's a party to. He's advancing it himself, and that to me is is quite a danger. That's quite a danger. The Green New Deal is a very scary phenomenon, and if and if the left gets what it wants, right? I mean, you have John Kerry talking recently about look, we need to accelerate our our um our weaning off of fossil fuels because we need to be net zero by 2030 well this is this is uh, you know six seven years away man uh it's, there's no possibility we can do that without great privation without really putting people through the paces uh, and they're determined to do it i mean he is utterly determined and he's one of the guys in charge of this and he's part of the biden administration Mm -hmm. So when I said earlier, uh, I think the 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 left are more focused on like screaming and shouting in the sort of in the public, you know, in the the private sector that is outside of government more than. So I, I haven't seen Democrats passing legislation saying, you know, smash the white supremacist patriarchy by force. They're they're more they're taking sure, sure the sure rest. That's yeah, no. in the education. It's in the education bills. That but that's have. not it's in it's, in, it's inserting critical race theory into every aspect of of the employment process, the academic process, so that people are more or less uh, uh, saturated with this demagoguery from the time they're kids all the way to the time. You I know, agree. They're, they're doing yeah. that. But that's but that's all outside of the government, isn't it? No, no, it's it's at the government's behest. I mean, they're doing it in state schools, right? They're they're doing it with respect to government organizations and institutions. Their hiring practices reflect these ideas, and they're sort of imposing this on on the rest of the world who are who are also using these standards as their ideal um so look they, they're scary man they they set the narrative and 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 they decide what moral what the moral ground is going to look like and the right just sort of reacts to that so that's what's particular that's what's really scary about the left to me mm -hmm. um is is their moral conviction the, the right isn't really morally convicted you know there's the crazy guy trump and there's people who have a beef and then there's the moral conviction of the left which has been which has been unfettered for 125 years they're smarter they know they have to do it incrementally sort of a fabian socialism sort of outlook um, and that's enabled them to get as far as they have and maybe they shot their wad a little too early like they revealed their hand you know at, because trump made it happen he made them reveal their hand and so they sort of accelerated the process that they've been going through for 120 years. But they're all about legislating our lives, too. And they they do it. You know, if they want to add more justices to the Supreme Court, I have no doubt that they will do it. If they want to take away the filibuster, I have no doubt that they will be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Any Anything that they set their mind to, to passing because they're morally convicted about what they do, they eventually do it. Wouldn't you say that um, the the Republicans or conservatives have a moral conviction when it comes to, you know, smashing the establishment and identifying who they consider to be groomers? That's a huge word in their vocabulary right now. Groomers, teachers, teaching sex ed are called groomers. Now, in some cases, they are pointing out very creepy stuff happening. But other times, I think they're way overusing that uh, that allegation against people. But uh, but they, they they do have moral vitriol. It's just, you know, against the, the so-called elitist establishment well, that they're the very, vitriol. very fuzzy with. The, the moral vitriol is more more uh, uh, cultural and, a, a, you know, it's a sense of the way the culture is going. 
But the what the Democrats do well, I think, is they have merged their sense of the of culture with government. They conflate the two, I think, uh, in their own lives and combine them in in practicality. So they force their culture. They they use the, their sense of of uh, government and human relations with it to further their their political agenda in a way that the right isn't, but they're suggesting it now with with DeSantis. With these, well, DeSantis isn't suggesting it. He's been doing it and will continue to do it. And, so, yeah. and so like what, like Trump bringing out the worst in the left, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I think the, the 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 perversions on the left is bringing out the worst in the right. And I think the right perceives, you know, a loss of something very real, Americanism, which they can't define, but they understand that it's something sacred and good that shouldn't be lost. And what they're trying to do is grab it back with strong men instead of principles. They know they know no other way. Right. Um, I, is a strong man. So from my perspective, it just looks like Republicans are going straight to the government. They're going straight to force the Democrats. They're largely changing the culture from within. So what you just said is is like the opposite of how I see it in terms of which party is using government versus playing the long game. I think the reason the left wins is because they know they're focused on changing the culture. They've got the artists, they've got the academia, and they're moving slow. So which for was like, done legal, which was done through legal means, which was done through politics too. I mean, you know, they, you know, instituting public schooling was one way of doing that, right? That, that comes from an idea about the individual, his relationship to the, to his fellow man, what our responsibilities and obligations are to each other. It comes from a philosophy that, that they perpetuate, that they that they um, that they like and want to promote, and they do it through government action. Um, they've been doing it for years and years and years and years and years. They're no different now. In fact, they're more vitriolic now. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I see no real difference between the two. I mean, it's a, it's a battle for who's going to win the legislature, the national socialists or the socialist socialists. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I mean, yeah, I agree. Like public schooling was a progressive move uh, in order to engineer society and, and, and have the government basically uh, educate or, you know, indoctrinate students with particular ideas. Um, well, progressive movement was about that. It was about mm-hmm. Wil- Wilson, particularly being an elitist, thinking the constitution bound him in ways that he didn't want to be bound, that scientific discoveries and and uh, and their, the fact that a, a scientific elite and political elite existed could make life better for human beings on earth. Why not use the institution of government unbound from the restraints of the constitution to progress this kind of state in the world because after all it's progressing human interests and they've been doing that since the early 1900s uh, no ar- no argument there no argument there so as, as long as we have a public school uh you're able it you can you can say yeah the 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 democrats the leftists the progressives are using the government to 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 force public their ideas school, on us public utilities uh academia that's supported and subsidized by the by the public which now I, there's I, the, a small tiny minority of academic institutions in in you know secondary education and post graduate education are not subsidized by the government the majority of them are and so they go where their interests lay right and it, it perpetuates a certain kind of establishment there's no denying that that's what DeSantis is saying is true he's recognizing this establishment exists it's toxic we got to fight it okay but his solution of course is just to switch parties switch the characters that occupy the the uh, the heights and uh, and to do what they want with respect to the heights which is not a whole lot different from what the other side wants when it comes to just the essential of controlling the individual and what they think and feel, how they act. I think I think even in his uh, description of the problem, uh, he exaggerates or or kind of um, paints with a broad brush at times. I think we're seeing a crazy um, navel gazing, sort of like looking inward movement. That is, you know, the conservatives. They they for a minute there they realize, oh, Trump is not a winning candidate. But then as soon as Elon Musk starts releasing these Twitter files, conservatives are getting this enormous throbbing hard on. And like they're just completely uh, withdrawing further and further from any place where like the average person can speak in a common tongue with them. So I think someone like DeSantis is like constantly just playing to the base, talking to the base, exaggerating the, the types of problems that he's describing. Yeah, there are there are these problems where uh, government and companies and the establishment 
um, are forcing all types of trash on us. But he's sloppy and uh, he's not my guy. Right on. He is. Yeah. Uh, So uh, anyway, we agree on the solution Uh, politically, of course, capitalism. uh, That's the only way out of this. We're not going to solve this by growing government, by extending regulations and and all of that, by electing our strong men against theirs. Divorcing the government from private life is the way out of this. That's politically and, of course, philosophically. People need to be more selfish and they need to be more rational. They need to be more calm in their thinking and focused. So uh, there's a lot a lot of work to do. And we thank you for your support, everybody. Uh, in the super chat, Allie Beard with $2 says, Mark gets accused as a Republican the most. Is that true? You get accused of being a Republican more yeah, than- Yeah, but that's that's because a lot of my buddies are on the left saying stupid shit. So I feel like I have to, I have to, I feel like a guy in glass house shouldn't throw stones. Here's what your guy's doing. Do you, or do you have a similar problem with that? And they never, they can never say, yes, I do. They can never say that. But they can accuse me of being, you know, on Trump's side um, because I, I point out, you know, well, you guys are doing this too. It's not what about isn't to point out hypocrisy. It's just it's, it's it's a fact. Now, if you really want justice, then you'll say both of these guys are guilty and throw them all in jail or censor mm-hmm. them, or whatever the hell the penalty is. But you're not. You're not honest. You're, right. You're, so, so I, I mean, get it. That, that shows you how tribal people people are as opposed to philosophical. They don't they're not actually listening to what we're about, what we believe. They're just like, oh, you're with this tribe or you're with that tribe. So a, a lot of people they hear the kind of exchange we're having today and they say like, oh, Mark leans right. Rucka leans left. But we literally want that. We have the same view of politics, what we want. We we are on the same team, so to speak. And but like we're we're one's right. The other's left because of. like I, I don't know. I'm, I'm inclined to think that. um I'm inclined to think like you, like I, I would like probably a Democratic president with uh, a, a split with a Republican uh, uh, House and Senate. I think that split usually works well for the Democrat and it usually works well for us because the Republicans only define themselves as a photo negative of what it is they're against. And they tend to fight. They tend to find some principle that we would consider classical liberalism within that, you know, that that crucible. Uh, and that's it. That's the only time they do it. And it, it redounds well for us. It helped Bill Clinton. It helped us. <laughs> and we and we need to do the same thing again, I think, uh, roughly to to find some some uh, relief for the, you know, the, the poor schmuck in the street who's getting murdered by these political elites. I uh, I wonder if that's even going to be if it's even going to have the I wonder if we'll even see the 90s play out again, because when uh, the conservatives have gone so far away from any like philosophical defense of individual rights and so much farther toward um, conspiracy theories and belief in that, you know, the elites are in full control of our lives. So having a Democrat president, no matter what it looks like, is going to be a rallying cry for them to all freak out. And a and a Republican Congress, I don't even know if that's going to be possible anytime soon, given the types of candidates they're nominating and just the type of rhetoric they're running with. DeSantis is supposed to be the shoe in. He's supposed to be the guy who um, is like the, he's not Trump and he, you know, and he's anti woke, but he's also like basically seems supposed to seem reasonable. And then he's starting to uh, like investigate like uh, vaccines and sort of play to that base. So he's basically making himself unelectable. It's just hard to hard to see Republicans uh, getting any seats anytime soon, but they will always be president and Congress and the Supreme Court of Twitter. Twitter is theirs and they are going to win the culture war in that respect. Uh, Kmetiha with two euros. Thank you for that. Uh, And did Michael in the chat ever ask his question? Because he was very vocal about his uh, inability to uh, super chat, I guess not. So uh, Michael, uh, we would have happily read your question because we don't care about money. It's the thought that counts. That being said, please leave a super thanks on this video on YouTube and hit the join button to become a member. All right, thanks, Mark. Uh, Good chat. And coming up at 7 p.m. UK time, it's the Briefly Objective premiere with Harry Binswinger on Jordan Peterson, the good and the bad. Uh, Then at 10 p.m. UK time, it's Life on Earth with Robert Naser. Uh, episode titled major announcement everything's going to be all right very nice uh thank you all 
<laughs> for joining us today. And uh, check out this Jared Polis guy, police guy, in uh, governor of Colorado. You'll forget what decade you're even li living in. He's such a pleasant man. All right. Uh, see you back tomorrow for the Daily Objective. And goodbye. <laughs>